uh, Josh uh, running back from both sides. Let's try that again. Casey, welcome. How are you? <laughs> Very good. Good to be here. How are you? I hope that you can visualize the scene of uh, Josh chatting you up before you're ready to come on for your segment. And then he has to go over to the other computer and click record to record your segment. And then when I say, how are you? Uh, he's still got to run back to the other side and pot up the microphone. So, you know, we've got quite an enjoyable scene going on here. Boy, I'll tell you what, Mike Gill takes one day off. No, it's all good. Uh, Casey, let's get into this Eagles game a little bit, uh, specifically starting with the decision to go for two. Uh, agree, disagree? What did you think when they did that at the end of the game? I totally agree. Uh, Mike and I were talking last week and, and mentioning that the one thing that hey, the Eagles were pretty much out of the playoffs. So, okay, if you're out of the playoffs over the last three games, if you're trying to send a message to your team, what message do you send? You want to send the message of let's be aggressive. Let's go down fighting because if you tell the team we're going to be aggressive, win or lose, we're going to try and go for this thing. Uh, I think that sends the kind of message that you want to put in their heads in the off season and tells the fans, hey, we're not trying to play conservative like we had the last few weeks. We're going to go ahead and take some chances since we had nothing to lose. And so when you're down by one and you get a chance to, to win a game against a team, uh, team of that caliber and you can do it on one play, yeah, I'd go ahead. I, w I don't have any problems with them making that kind of a call. Go ahead and try and win it. Casey, you're a guy who loves to crunch the numbers. You love what the numbers tell you. Uh, Doug Peterson, after the game yesterday, said that his team had a less than 50% chance of winning if they went to overtime. Can you explain it better than he did? Yeah, uh, when it comes, if you're looking at, if you go into the ESPN has different uh, measurements for measuring win probability. And if you're the Eagles and the way the Eagles have played this year and you're playing on the road and you're playing a tough Ravens team, you add all those factors together and say, okay, now, you know, you need to, you know, you're going to have to either score a touchdown against this defense or you're going to have to hold them from not scoring a touchdown. You start adding all those factors together and the win probabilities would have said that uh, Baltimore had a better than 50% chance of winning. And again, if you think and you should hope that you do. If you think that when you're calling a two-point play that you've got at least a 50% chance of going of, of making that play, and that's really what you're trying to, to get is at least a 50-50 chance. If you've got that, then, yeah, if you, if you have less than 50% chance, 50 chance of winning by win probability and you've got more than 50% chance of hitting the play, why not do it? You know what, see, now, why can't Doug, Pete, why can't Doug explain <laughs> things like Casey just did? Uh, well, because that would make sense. Yeah. <laughs> Casey, when you look at uh, some of the other players on this team, I, I mean, the Eagles. It was said today in the in the in the press conference that they've had one play over thirty yards in the last six weeks. Um, asked Doug about why they don't take shots downfield more, he says he'll go for the slant and try to get it to run, you know, yards after the catch. How I, I, you do a great job of this? How bad is the Eagles' lack of downfield threat? The Eagles do have uh, a uh, significant issue on, on downfield plays. I mean, they, you know, the, uh, uh, Wentz is one of the worst quarterbacks in vertical yards per attempt. But I tell you what, he should have been talking about is how good the Eagles' rushing attack has been was yesterday. The Eagles, I, it was now I won't say phenomenal. I'm not going to go that far. But the Eagles yesterday, and they had 38 rushes for 169 yards and two touchdowns. Okay, they they had their highest. Rushing yards after contact total yesterday, the highest of the season. They're the third highest rushing yards before first contact. And what's notable about that is Baltimore came into that game yesterday ranked first in rushing defense, first in rushing touchdowns allowed, first in rush yards before first defensive contact, first in rush yards after first defensive contact. And all the Eagles do is put up the highest rushing yards total against Baltimore yesterday. They scored two rushing touchdowns against them, the highest total Baltimore has given up all year. They get the most rushing yards after first defensive contact and the third most rushing yards before first defensive contact. So they came into that game saying, we're going to power run this football, and we're going to punch these guys right in the mouth. And at least in that sense, they were very successful. Casey Joyner with us talking Eagles uh, as the birds lose by one point yesterday. And Casey, it's almost like you sensed what I was going to ask you about next. The Ryan Matthews, the over 100 yards rushing versus that number one rush defense in the NFL. The Eagles were without their starting left guard or right tackle. How, how did that happen? They've been in the top 10 all year and sometimes in the top five Philadelphia has in my good blocking rate metric that measures how often and often gives its ball carriers quality run blocking. It's really important because ball carriers are five times as productive, roughly five times as productive on plays and they get good run blocking as they are and they don't get good run blocking. So the Eagles have been able to do that all year. 
And the troubling part is that, you know, that they've had, sometimes they've wanted to use, do we use Sproles as a bell cow back or power back, and he can't do that role, and Matthews is too banged up to be a guy that you can lean on all the time. But they've got the blocking. They've had the blocking all year. The scheme works for it. And the thing I'm looking forward to, I don't want to get too far ahead. Of, you know, we've got a couple of games left, but if you're looking forward to the draft, there are three potential impact running backs in the 2017 NFL draft. Three, Deontay Foreman, Leonard Fournette, and Dalvin Cook, three potential impact players who could be available to Philadelphia in the first round. So I'm looking at this rushing attack here and going, okay, you guys don't have a running back right now who can do this sort of thing, but I'm looking at their future saying, can you imagine if they add that kind of a running back to this type of rushing, you know, this type of run blocking, top five run blocking? You could, uh, you could start to – I'm not saying you're going to be yeah, Ezekiel Elliott in Dallas, but now you've got something to build on, definitely. They are getting something back in Lane Johnson, who was uh, back from a 10-game suspension today. Um, when you look at what the Eagles were able to do before Johnson's suspension, it seemed like Wentz had more time to throw. The running game was a little more consistent. Um, well, what do you make of his return, and, and how much better do you expect the line to do with him back in there? Yeah, I would expect that they would do even better. I mean, again, I said they were ranked in the top five earlier in the season. When he left, their numbers started to drop off as far as uh, you know, how, how well they did in the good blocking rate metric and how often, how good they did in the good blocking yards per attempt, which is how productive you are when you get good blocking. So those numbers dropped up. They didn't, I mean, again, you know, seeing what they did yesterday, they still were, you know, they, 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 they've been good all year long. They haven't had a game really where they've not been able to do very well. But I'm hoping that, you know, they only threw eight vertical passes yesterday. Uh, vertical pass being when you throw the ball 11 or more yards, 11 or more yards downfield. They had had four straight games before that where they had a double digit in total in vertical passes, and they had you know against the, the Bengals they had 20 of those passes. So I know part of that was game flow, but they threw 20 against the Giants, and again part of that is game flow. When you throw an eight per game, it's just such a low number, and you're only getting 48 yards on those vertical passes. That was one of the lowest totals they had all year. They were getting anything on the vertical passing game. So I'm thinking if you can get better pass blocking, maybe in these last two games you can and say, okay, now we could be aggressive with a running attack. And if you've got that kind of rushing attack and you're doing that well against the number one rush defense in the league, imagine if you add that and say, okay, now we can get past Buck and start to go vertical just a bit more, even for our lousy wide receivers, I think it could be a better combination. For a second, and we'll flip over the defense for a second. Casey, the defense inconsistent, but after the game, Jalen Mills quoted as questioning Jim Schwartz's play calling. Do you question how Jim Schwartz was game calling the game versus the Ravens' offense? It's 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 tough to you want to. I mean, you do want to. You do want to say, okay, well, maybe they're not being aggressive up. I mean, Baltimore only threw seven vertical passes. You know, they got 102 yards on those vertical throws. It's one of the lowest totals that uh, Philadelphia's allowed all season. They only allowed uh, three completions on vertical passes. It's not like they were giving up anything big through the air. And you know, I'm, I'm looking at this, you know, just looking at that going, okay, well, I know if you're Jim Schwartz, think about it this way. With this personnel that you have or the secondary that you have, do you really want to go ahead and, and start leaving those guys on an island, even against uh, uh, Baltimore? Because Baltimore, by the way, Flacco, he may not be an elite quarterback as far as his production goes, but they will allow him to throw 30 or 40 passes in the game if, as a defense, you give them a situation that allows them to throw that many passes. So you, if you're Schwartz, you're saying, I don't want them throwing 30 or 40 passes. I don't think their rush offense is that good, so I want them to be throwing dink and dunk passes and trying to go with, uh, with running plays instead, instead of trying to attack my really weak pass defense. So I can't take the tack that he didn't call a good game because he made the uh, – Baltimore do the things that they wanted them to do. Uh, Casey, we saw Nelson Aguilar get a carry on fourth and two um, on a jet sweep. We've seen Nelson Aguilar drop one pass for sure yesterday that hit him in the hands. I'm just curious what the numbers say on Nelson Aguilar. Can you put in perspective? Uh, it certainly feels like and seems like it's been a very, very disappointing season for him. Yeah, he, his catch rates are low. His drop rates are high. And I think – well, let's put this way. You just talked about you know using the amount of jet sweep and things. Maybe we can say we're here to say we're talking. Or we're talking about you know Schwartz's play calling and such. When you look at the team as a whole and you say, okay, what's their play calling? They keep putting their players in the bad situations and they keep getting caught out of position. There was a play yesterday. Uh, it was called a flip ninety. It's where you fake a, a run play to the right side and then you do a little flip to the back on the left. And I believe that Baltimore scored a touchdown on that play. It's the second week in a row that Philadelphia's been beat on a flip ninety play. Uh, you know, Washington did one with uh, with a creative. They did a, a different thing where they faked one way and then they did a, a, a flip ninety sweep. It was a different 
different kind of variation, but still, it shows that you're not going to protect the edge, that you're going to crash down too hard on the play, and your ends aren't going to stay home where they should be. So I don't know if that's a schematic thing or if that's a, a you know, if that's a coaching thing or a playing thing, but defenses keep doing that. So I think the defenses are seeing, or the offenses keep doing that. So I think they're seeing something at the Eagles defense that says, we think we can get this play around the corner. So it might be a play calling issue, and that might be where the players are coming up and saying, we think we're getting out coached because there are situations where the coaches are putting us in the situations that the other team is just beating us easily because we're out of position. Uh, Casey, I know you talked about uh, Carson Wentz earlier. Um, you know, we hear some of the people that, that the, the, the uh, you know so called experts who who say the Eagles have their guy. This is a franchise quarterback. You can build around him. What are you seeing? What what says to you that this guy is good as gold for this franchise for the next decade or more? Um, he hasn't collapsed against the pressure. In other words, when things have been going badly for him, he hasn't regressed. You see him keep fighting. You see him, and, and all these are non-metric things. But I keep thinking back to like uh, you go to Eli Manning back in his rookie season, and I remember he had a game against the Ravens his rookie season, and it was abysmal. If you just based it off of that game, you'd say this guy doesn't belong. He should be a third stringer. He shouldn't be out there as a starter. He's not going to be a two-time Super Bowl champion, a potential Hall of Famer. You'd never expect it. But if you look at the positives of that game, Eli stepped up and he stood up in the pocket and he still stood in there. He didn't quit. He didn't collapse. And the teammates saw this guy's going to keep fighting. And I think that's the thing you're seeing with Wentz. Yeah, his mechanics might be a little bit off because he's getting a little tired. Okay, well, he's you know, this is the first rookie. It's the first season, and as a rookie, you're going to have a transition to you know, a longer schedule and such. So you're not seeing those sorts of things out of him. But you start, you still see that he's doing all the things that you want him to do. He's standing in there. He's not feeling the pass rush pressure too much. And I keep thinking. What would happen if this guy actually had some good receivers? Because you could put a lot of quarterbacks into this situation where, okay, hey, here's your receivers. You get Dorio Grimm back. And, hey, you've got Matthews, a solid slot receiver. You've got a couple tight ends. you got Aguilar. These are your guys. I can imagine there are a number of quarterbacks out there who wouldn't be able to post elite numbers. In fact, there's only a couple of quarterbacks I could think of who could post elite numbers with these guys. So I'm not going to hold it too much against Wentz that he can't post numbers under these circumstances. Casey Joyner with us here on the Sports Bash on 97.3. You can follow him on Twitter at Casey. Casey Joyner, TFS, and Casey also covers the rest of the league as well, more than just the Eagles and the Ravens from week to week. So we'll ask you some of the other games and some of the things that took place. Casey, run through a few of those real quick. The Cowboys beat the Bucks last night, but Tampa had the chance to win the game despite four turnovers. After two weeks, what have the Bucks and the Giants shown us about Dallas? Uh, well, they've shown that you can that you can stop Dak Prescott, or at least the Giants showed you can stop Dak Prescott if you can make the Cowboys play a certain type of game. But last night, the Cowboys showed that they can counterpunch and say, okay, Dak Prescott got to throw a lot of dink and dunk passes, and we've got a dink and dunk offense. We can do that. So even what those teams did show that you could do against against Dallas, even you know, again, especially what Tampa showed you could do against Dallas, or against the Giants showed you could do against Dallas, I still don't, you know, the Dallas is now showing we're counterpunching to what, what, what would be a potential weakness. So if I'm Dallas, I'm still scared about playing the Giants because the Giants do seem to have their number. But I don't think other teams are going to be replicate what New York did. And even what Tampa did last night, okay, it, show, it shows that, you know, maybe Dallas's defense isn't as powerful, I think, as people would say that they are cause, based on that second half. But I'm still not worried about Dallas. They're still my number one team. The Steelers come from behind. They beat the rival Bengals, did we finally see the Pittsburgh team that everyone thought would be a Super Bowl contender before the season? Yeah, their defense is playing exceptionally well now. They they're had their passing game. They're not even hitting a, as many passes to uh, to Antonio Brown. People are even asking about Antonio Brown's usage in the offense. He's getting as much usage as he should. So the Steelers do have some weaknesses in the sense that outside of Brown, and they've got Ladarius Green at tight end. They've got uh, their receiving core. They've got Rodgers, and they've got Hamilton. They've got a couple guys who really are unproven. So they don't have a lot of depth there. But I still think yesterday showed us. Cincinnati should have learned in the past the curse of the terrible towel. You never do anything bad to the terrible towel because they were outscored 21-3 to after Hill tore up the terrible towel, and you just never do that. The Titans won in KC. Tennessee has an identical record on the road as at home this season, 4-3. and three. What are your odds on their chances of making the playoffs? 
I just did an ESPN article today, an ESPN Insider article. You can find it on the NFL section of ESPN.com, talking, or actually the fans football section of ESPN.com, talking about Marcus Mariota and how he struggled in the past two weeks because he hasn't played quite as well the past two weeks. And actually, Jacksonville presents a tough matchup, a tougher matchup than it might seem since they fired their head coach. Uh, their defensive numbers are, are in many ways, if they're not exceptional, they're upper tier. And I think that uh, Mariota could struggle next week, but. They've got the, maybe the best rushing attack in the NFL, and they've got enough weapons, I think, they'll win next week. And they're the type of team that, they're with, given what their rushing offense can do, and given how well Mario has played overall since week five, which from week five to week 13, he might have been the best quarterback in the NFL or right up there in the top three. If he plays that well, they're a team that can get to the playoffs and make a little noise. In the AFC South, the Texans bench Brock Osweiler. They put in Tom Savage, the Rutgers guy, who helps lead them to a victory. Bill O'Brien said today, Savage is their starter this weekend. What are your thoughts on the change at quarterback in Houston? Uh, besides the fact that he has a really cool professional wrestling caliber name, um, <laughs> Savage is, uh, he's replacing Osweiler, who is the, was the second worst vertical passer in the NFL this season. Osweiler was just as bad on vertical passes last year. If you go back to his college days, he was one of the worst in his uh, senior season, his last season at Arizona State. When he got a pass rush against him and he was put under duress, he had some of the worst vertical numbers in college football. I think he was 57th out of like 62 qualifying quarterbacks in vertical uh, production when he got under pass rush pressure. He's just not a vertical passing quarterback, and Savage may not be an elite quarterback. He may not be uh, the NFL equivalent of the Macho Man, but he's going to be a better yeah. vertical passer, and that makes him a better quarterback. I once met the Macho Man. He was a wonderful guy. He told me to snap into a Slim Jim. Honest to God, that's the truth. <laughs> Uh, the Falcons ran all over an ugly 49ers defense. Atlanta's been Jekyll and Hyde this year. Which team will we see if they make the playoffs, the powerful offense or the team that trips all over itself? Uh, Atlanta's got the unfortunate issue of they've got a great offense, but they're a kind of reminder of a lot of great teams we've seen in the NFL over the years who could put up a ton of points but also give up a lot of points. 84 Dolphins. Eric Coriel, uh, the, the you know, Vikings team in the 90s, and things, teams that can score a ton of points but are going to give up a ton of points. When that happens, when even you, if you look at NFL history and look at the best offenses in NFL history, the ones that score 500 or more points, when they get in the shootout games, which means both teams score 24 or more points, those teams are barely over 500. Atlanta has an offense that might be at that 500-point caliber or close to it. They've got that. You know, it could be. I don't know if it's quite to that caliber. It's pretty darn close. They've got that kind of offense, but the kind of defense they have, they're going to get into shootouts in those 50-50 propositions. So even if they make the playoffs, you know, you're not going to win three straight of 50-50 props. Talking with Casey Joyner here on the Sports Bash. And, Casey, the Redskins play tonight with Josh Norman versus his old team, the Panthers. Are the Redskins a team that no one in the NFC wants to see in the playoffs with that offense and Kirk Cousins playing as well as he's been? Yep, Kirk Cousins since uh, week four has vertical passing numbers. I think only Tom Brady has better vertical pass numbers than Kirk Cousins. I haven't looked at the uh, numbers through yesterday, but uh, going into yesterday, I believe he was second in vertical yard in vertical uh, yards per attempt uh, since week four. So he's just either playing at an elite level. Jackson's back to full health, and he looks as good as, as he has been now. Carolina's played a lot better in their secondary of late, but some of that has to do with their competition level. I think Washington's going to put some really big numbers tonight, and they are the kind of team where we talk about the shootout games. I mean, if you're Dallas, if you had to face Washington in the playoffs, they are a team that could go out and get Dallas into a shootout. And, they, and you, if you can get into shootouts, the thing is you can win games that you're not supposed to win. So I think uh, Washington is like Atlanta, where you know they can get in the playoffs and win one, but I don't know if they're going to win three. And we'll wrap up with this one, Casey. Who do you think will win the NFC North, the streaking Packers with Aaron Rodgers or those comeback kids from Detroit with Matt Stafford? I, uh, Green Bay has – actually, they both have issues in their secondary right now. And But right now I think uh, the Lions have a little bit of a better rushing attack, and I still think their defense is better overall. So it, that's a, it's, it's such a tough call. And it all depends a lot, I think, on, uh, on Stafford's hand if, if he's uh, if that injury is. Because yesterday, yeah, he, pulled, he doesn't look good against the Giants, but the Giants have one of the best defenses, pass defenses in the NFL. So you go, okay, well, that, that might have been just that. But if his finger is not, that is not where it should be, it could be like Oakland was a car. They didn't look like they were either. So if he's banged up, I'm taking uh, I'm taking the Rogers or I'm taking the Packers, even if Rogers does have that calf injury. Now I'm not Mike Gill, and I don't profess to know a lot about the WWE. But Booker T says it's time for the WWE to give Hulk Hogan another chance. 
Uh, I think that it, it, the WWE will always do whatever the fans want them to do. If they if they can pull their fans and the fans want Hogan to come back, then they'll bring it back. And if they don't, they won't. I think they'll do. They'll go exactly the direction that their fans want them to go. And although I will mention, if you don't mind, that I did an article for ESPN's. WB uh, section that uh, there's a training center here in Orlando that uh, they've got a it's called the Performance Center it's where the WB trains their up and coming stars and they have a I guess the best term you could use is a fantasy camp where it's an all access fantasy camp where you can go in there and 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 do like you can take part in a professional wrestling uh, you know, a whole an entire card and you get to be manager and things of that nature and I wrote an article they gave me some behind the scenes access and I wrote an article for that for you to spend WB section so if anybody's ever interested in doing that sort of thing and taking part in a fantasy camp, check that article out. Absolutely. No, I don't mind at all. I, I love to talk about the Performance Center, and I love to listen to you and Mike Gill go back and forth on wrestlers that I think, like, now that's a wrestler, right? Now that's a wrestler, right? So I'm a little bit of a rookie <laughs> talking uh, anything wrestling, but, hey, I did meet the Macho Man once, so I've got that going for me, which is nice. Casey Joyner joins us each week on the Sports Bash, and we hope to catch up with you later in the week as well. Thanks so much, pal. Appreciate it, guys.